Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the DHIS2 Digital Academy for Track to Use webinar, uh, day one. Uh, we welcome you all on behalf of the University of Oslo and his groups in the Asia region, uh, his India, his Sri Lanka, and his Vietnam. Uh, today, the webinar will focus upon the tracker use cases which are uh, being implemented in different parts of the Asia region. We have three distinguished speakers today who would be presenting their experiences on their tracker implementations. First, we have Dr. Keshav Deva representing Save the Children and National Center for AIDS and STD Control, Nepal. He would be presenting his experiences on the HIV care and ART tracker implementation in Nepal. Then we have Dr. Pamo Damarakun representing his Sri Lanka. He will be presenting his experience on implementing the COVID surveillance and vaccination platform in Sri Lanka. And last, we have Dr. John Lewis, uh, who is representing uh, University of Oslo and also leading his Vietnam team. He would be presenting the TB information system implementation in Laos. Uh, the structure of the webinar would be the, the speakers would be presenting their presentations for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, the participants are requested to put the questions in the chat box and at the end of the presentation for each speaker, we'll take up the questions and uh, we'll have around 10 minutes of uh, Q&A and then we'll proceed to our next uh, presentation. So without any further delay, I'd request uh, Dr. Keshav to please uh, share his screen and start with the presentation. Thank you, Saurabh. Is my screen visible? Yes, Keshav, please go ahead. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Keshav Deva and as, uh, I'm working as a senior strategic information specialist at National Center for AIDS and STD Control in Nepal. And today I'm going to present about our experiences, lesson learned of using DHIS2 tracker in National HIV program of Nepal. Uh, why it's not moving slide? Okay, it's here. So this is my presentation outline. So I will uh, share like uh, briefly why we build DHS to track a based information system and what issues we want to solve uh, to improve strategic information of uh, HIV program in Nepal. And then we'll briefly present about the features of the developed system, what we developed and all the different components we integrated with the DHS to tracker. And in third topic will be our experiences, uh, our piloting rollout experiences at the national level and the key lesson learned uh, while uh, implementing uh, these developed information system at the national level. And the last topic would be our ongoing efforts and the plan uh, to strengthen like uh, information system of national HIV program using uh, DHIS2 tracker. So this is about background why we used a tracker in HIV program, because we are facing lots of issues and challenges. First one is to like, when someone like uh, any individual gets uh, infected with HIV, she or he has to enroll in treatment for whole life. So recording of treatment details and analyzing or reporting its outcome using paper-based registers is not feasible because if someone is, let's say is on treatment for 10 years, and taking drugs for 10 years, we need to record each follow-up visit uh, data of that uh, patient or client. So if, if health centers or any health workers want to analyze uh, any outcomes of the treatment, then it would be really, really not feasible to uh, doing analysis or reporting using paper-based registers. The second major issue we faced was like uh, the, uh, that time the system was unable to track duplications of cases across like between sites or between districts due to lack of unique identifier system. And this also further uh, affected by a reporting of monthly aggregated data to the national system. What happens is like if someone is on treatment, if he or she moves from one district to another district, there is a chance like that person is counted as a new on treatment. Or 
if some new person identified recently diagnosed with HIV infection, he or she can go to multiple sites uh, to confirm their HIV infections. Then there is also chance that the same individuals can be reported to the national system from multiple sites. That would like overestimate our like HIV treatment coverage or double reporting of same patient client uh, from multiple sites to the national system. This was second major challenges. And then uh, because we invest a lot of resources and we implement lots of uh, like programs, interventions to improve uh, the, the life expectancies of people living with HIV. So like just by recording the provided information in paper-based registers and reporting aggregated key indicators would not like, uh, like provide any evidence for us at the national system at, or at different levels. So we didn't know in real time what interventions our program are working or what's not because there was no availability of individual level information of uh, client or patient who are enrolled in our HIV care. So we didn't know exactly like uh, if detailed information, the key characteristics or reasons of poor performance of clients in HIV care. If, if we want to know like who, if uh, uh, certain percentage of uh, patient are with poor adherence or poor retention, if there are lots of treatment failure, if you want to further dig down to know the core reasons, it was not possible due to like monthly aggregated uh, data reported into the national system. So another major issues was like, even if you want to know like how many uh, people living with HIV or client or patients are on treatment till yesterday, uh, just to get that information, it took us took us like two to three months. So, so it's like, uh, really difficult to know in real time, like how many of them are on treatment, how many of them are lost to follow up, how many of them are died, even just to get this information, like uh, it took us months at the national level. So to address this issue, we uh, designed the concept and this is the figure. Uh, and based on this system, like this idea concept, what happens is DHIS2 here, is there was like a system existing uh, in Nepal where sites can uh, monthly report uh, their data to the uh, national system using DHIS2 or key indicators. That's aggregated information. So to address these issues, we tried, we wanted to solve the existing problem by using DHIS2 tracker at the site to record individual level information. And since uh, the clients, uh, they also have to like uh, take uh, this uh, medicine for whole life. We also want to use this mobile health uh, into within the tracker so that we can send SMS to the mobile of uh, PLSIV to improve retention and treatment. And we also decided to link the biometric system uh, with uh, tracker so that the health system can easily identify the client's uh, movement or also keep track of their medical records. So to, to translate this concept into the practice, so we collaborated, we partnered with uh, HISP India uh, so that we can develop system and to, uh, to use this uh, system in all HIV treatment centers of Nepal in reality. So first, uh, what we did was, uh, why I can move this uh, slide. Yeah, so, uh, so that it would help us to uh, get individual level information. And then uh, uh, these are the like uh, features of develop system. First, what we did with technical support from East India to, uh, to integrate like link uh, mobile health within DSS2 tracker for that. Uh, we like uh, develop third party SMS uh, gateway uh, within DHIS2 for sending SMS to the enrolled client. We have given consent for being part of the mobile health program. And then um, custom scripts like schedule, based on the schedule, uh, we filter the messages and type of uh, messages, periodicity of the SMS, like what type of messages should be sent to which group of uh, clients. So based on this, uh, we link DHS2 uh, the ML within DHS2 tracker. Second is uh, biggest challenge was to uh, link like use biometric system within DHS2 tracker. So these are the informations how we uh, integrate biometric system within DHS2 tracker. I've also provided link 
uh, for biometric code for your further information. And then uh, these are the like uh, system features. In the left side, it's uh, like DHIS2 based uh, like, uh, wavelength. We can use like hibh.gov.np where uh, mHealth is also integrated within this system. The health workers working at the site, they can register and record information of provided services uh, we're using this HIV care and AI to tracking system. And here in the right side is a uh, biometric system. It's uh, Java-based applications uh, developed by India. Here uh, we can like the health workers can log in the same login provided to them for uh, the HIV tracker. And uh, they have to log in into the both information system to record uh, the information of patient and or to identify the existing patient or client is already on the system or not. So this is the biometric device, figure of biometric device, uh, which help us to identify whether the someone is already on the treatment or not. If someone is already on the treatment, then it help us to access medical history of the patient or client. And then if someone is the new, then it also help us to uh, register that new patient into the system with the biometric system also help us to link uh, to add patient's details in DSIS to tracker capture app. And another third uh, like key activities, uh, the biometric system support is to, if someone is already like diagnosed HIV positive from HIV testing and counseling sites, if they refer to the HIV treatment centers, then uh, that means uh, the sites can already record the patient information in DSIS to tracker. They can electronically uh, send those uh, form to the HIV treatment sites. And then health workers working at the uh, HIV treatment sites can also update fingerprints uh, to the patient already registered at STC sites. And this is the DHS tracker app, uh, which allow us to, for the following functionality, we can like register, enroll uh, the client in uh, the HIV program. We can also refer the, from HIV testing sites to treatment sites and from treatment sites, one treatment sites to another treatment sites. If some patient wants to, uh, take medicines from on other sites or in another districts. So within that tracker system, we have like created multiple stages. If someone comes for HIV testing, we also re record their information. If someone found is diagnosed HIV positive, then we also record their medical history. And if they come for frequent follow-up, then we also record their follow-up. If the HIV positive is a woman, if she became pregnant, then we also record their pregnancy, delivery details. If uh, uh, baby is born, then we also record their HIV positive status, their treatment status. If someone is like uh, death uh, or lost to follow-up missing, we also record such information uh, of client or patient in the system. And the M Health, uh, like uh, why we included it is because there are like evidences. If we send frequent like uh, the SMS, a reminder SMS to the client or patient that improve the retention in treatment among the uh, those are clients. So what we did is we created two types of messages. One is appointment reminder. Second is general awareness messages. Appointment reminder send, send for like pill pickup, CD4 test, viral load test, and then general awareness messages are sent to the client of PLS uh, clients or patient about the importance of regular health checkup or positive prevention. So all these uh, messages are developed in Nepali. And I'm now I'm going to present about our, some of our implementation experiences and the lesson learned. What we did is we first uh, first identified uh, the sites for piloting of our developed system. We did piloting in the capital city in large HIV treatment centers of Nepal. And before doing that, we also developed uh, user manuals uh, to guide health workers to use the system, uh, both in Nepali and English language. And we are before uh, that we also side by side also make sure that all the required necessary infrastructure like server, biometric device, CTC were ready and installed. And uh, there was also team like a uh, central team at the center also with technical backup from East India ready to support or address any issues that occur during the piloting. So after successful piloting and uh, addressing the feedback from the health workers uh, working at the piloting sites. Uh, we rolled out uh, this developed system in additional HIV treatment sites of Nepal uh, by using methods of on-site coaching. The center team visited the 
the rollout sites and we guided them and we provided them all the uh, the resources even guidelines that are required uh, to use this system on a day-to-day -day basis for piloting uh, east india also visited nepal and they also guided us uh, for successful implementation of uh, piloting we also like uh, planned in beforehand uh, the additional resources that required such as uh, we need to like uh, we have we conducted several batches of trainings to train the health workers working at the sites or the the province level so we we uh, allocated the resources uh, financial human resource uh, and any other sort of resources that required beforehand we plan for it and immediately these are the like lesson learned what uh, we uh, like uh, learned uh, immediately after rollout of our day flow systems especially uh, after rolling out to this system to additional sites uh, some of the sites uh, complain us about the double recording system they also have to like uh, record the information in paper based registers also in tracker they also complain it uh, increased their workload and there were like interrupted internet supply or slow internet speed at few sites. And uh, what happened is like uh, the treatment uh, services started in 2004 and five in Nepal, but we uh, piloted this system in 2017. So there were like huge backdated data, especially in ERD sites having high client load because when we started there were like close to 17,000 PLSIV on treatment. So it takes around like 50 to 60 minutes to enter backdated data in tracker of one client who, in, who is on ART for eight to 10 years. And they also complain about it. And to address these issues, we have to like hire additional human resource to enter data into enter backdated data to DSS to tracker. And there were we found like incomplete information in paper based registers. So we didn't have any source to record a major information into tracker. And there was another issues in the beginning. We solve it later because we use a Nepali date, which is called Bikram Sambat. Uh, but here at Tracker, uh, there was dates of AD. So uh, most of the in paper based register, they use Nepali date. They, again, this also increased their workload to translate this, uh, convert this Nepali date to this AD. So, but later we address this issue. Yeah, this also like uh, was a big headache for the, the health workers working at the sites. <clears throat> Regarding my, uh, mobile health, that is like, uh, in, in briefly like getting SMS. Despite we haven't used uh, PLSIV, HIV related uh, terms, we use uh, no, neutral terms so that even someone else read the SMS of a mobile of PLSIV or our client, no one would understand what the, this message is related to. But despite that, uh, some of the PLSIV denied providing mobile number due to fear about disclosure of their HIV status. And some of the PLSIV complain about the frequency of text messages delivered through the system, but we also, based on the recommendations, we also reduce the frequency of the text messages. Another like biometric system, in the beginning, we thought that most of the uh, clients or patient would refuse uh, to provide their bio, like fingerprint, but uh, none of the sites, uh, luckily, or none of the sites reported like PLSIV refused to provide fingerprint. So uh, the clients or patient easily accepted it after briefing the purpose and the process of the biometric system. <clears throat> the HR related, human resource related, uh, not enough time because to enter data in the DHIS2 tracker, because the health workers working at HIV treatment centers are overburdened due to other responsibilities in emergency ward. And another major challenge uh, was like high turnover of the staff at the site. So we need to provide like frequent trainings uh, to them like uh, then we like uh, develop system we rolled out and throughout the process is india was supporting us and uh, we were so excited uh, like okay we are now this is a very good system uh, okay we are going to get this uh, very important disaggregated data uh, so that we can monitor progress of national HIV program but in reality what happens uh, like after a few months of rollout is that uh, there was like sites where like not like uptaking the developed systems uh, because uh, there was like very very slow progress in data recording in tracker and when we call sites to query about slow progress in using system most of the health workers even don't remember way, way for tracker capture so 
And in summary, like immediately, like few, after a few months of our rollout, what we came to know, like not all sites excited and happy to use DSIS to track our base information system. At least not much excited as us working at this center. So after that, we had like several meetings for how to like, why resistance to use information system by health workers at the health centers. So what we, the key answer we came to know is like, uh, we, because we never cared to answer their main questions during rollout of system. That is, why do they use this new information system and provide additional time considering their existing overworld like workload. We never cared about their this uh, care to answer this question. So during uh, rollout, we mostly focused on our advantages, just uh, advantages at the center or federal level, such as use of individual level data to monitor treatment outcomes at national level, ARB regime and info would help us to provide information for procurement, uh, gender real-time information of PLS have in country, we do just care about our advantages during rollout, but uh, that would not encourage health workers to use our information system because they have to face a lot of like activities, implement a lot of activities of the health centers. So immediately after that, we like to motivate site, we started to focus on answering key questions. Like there are like different reasons why site must use this information system which will ultimately reduce their workload. And we have used like several strategies to convince health workers sites that information system was developed to reduce their workload and support their day-to-day -day operations of services. Now, like uh, we also prioritize like data use plan at sites, not just like recording data into the system, but we also prioritize how can they use these recorded data to support their day-to-day -day operations of services. Now these are like a few examples. What we did is immediately after what we uh, communicate with sites is like they can generate monthly report with one click and upload it to national system so that they don't have to prepare report in SMIS recommended format manually, which greatly saved their time, which also was like great interest for them. Another example was like, uh, we also provided like develops uh, site level dashboard. We developed several indicators so that the site can monitor both aggregated indicator and individual level data patient for their planning their response. For example, uh, they can easily show the list of clients who need attention based on the parameters of retention and treatment. Let's say some, uh, they can easily download uh, from tracker like uh, details of loss to follow up client so that they can download and print it to the, and they give it to the different teams who are providing community home-based and care services uh, so that they can contact those clients and then improve the retention. Or based on the list, they can also adapt their dispensing practices. They can easily identify the virological suppress patient or those who are coming to on time pill pickup so that they can target those patients or reduce their frequency of visit to the sites. And we also organize several capacity development activities so that they can, their capacity can be improved and they can show interest into the system. We have, especially in the case of uh, this COVID-19 situations, we also develop YouTube videos to learn more about the information system. Uh, these, uh, these like different activities uh, motivated uh, them to use this system and they start slowly, slowly, uh, they started using this information system. Now, currently, like we have more than 33,000 PLS IV ever enrolled in treatment, we, uh, the data recorded into the system. This is the one example of this right figure, uh, like at the national level or site level, they can monitor this aggregated dashboard. Red means uh, they require attention. Green means okay. And by this, they can know their site status. And uh, this is the figure like uh, the one of the trainings we organized to capacitate site level and province level health workers. And after this, now currently we have like rolled out this information system in all SIV treatment centers of Nepal where they can record SIV testing and treatment services. And what happens in SIV program is not only we talk about SIV testing, treatment, viral suppression related uh, services. There are other services like implemented by government and other partners like prevention services. That means they are, these are the activities 
which are implemented to prevent HIV from getting HIV infection, like distributing condoms, lubricants, uh, community testing, or providing PrEP. Uh, there are like lots of services, which is also implemented in Nepal. There are also different HIV care and support services to improve survival of uh, our clients or patient. So what our plan is to generate desegregated data for this whole HIV care continuum using DHIS to tracker. That means this prevention intervention, testing, enrollment in HIV care. If someone is enrolled in HIV treatment, and then whether how many of them are still on the treatment and this whole continuum information we are planning to uh, generate uh, from the DHIS to tracker. <clears throat> uh, so that it would be like, uh, help us to like uh, get generated uh, real time data at different level site, local level, province level or federal level for informed response against HIV epidemic in the country. So what we'll do is uh, we'll generate DHIS to tracker uh, data, record data in DHS to tracker. And then we'll also integrate those data recorded in tracker to the national SMIS. So it would help us to standardize recording and reporting system of national SI program. And it would also help us to ensure data consistency and data validity at all levels. So for this and uh, to ensure aim uh, like successfully implement this plan activities, uh, HISP India is uh, closely supporting us. And uh, this is the conclusion, like uh, there are lots of advantages of DHIS to tracker based recording reporting, uh, but these are the few like I provided here. DHIS tracker based information system provide real time data evidence to different levels so that the site which can support a, like, uh, like uh, plan the responses or allocate resources to close gaps in HIV treatment delivery. And the sites can also perform or monitor the targets were already reached or not, so that they can, or the center or province can design public health actions to improve quality of HIV treatment. And it's the, especially the dashboard also alerts health workers at HIV treatment centers or site about specific areas which require attention and supports overall optimization of patient care which is like almost impossible by using paper-based registers because if there are like 2,000 or 3,000 PLSIB in one ERD center, so it's not possible to immediately identify uh, like poor performing uh, patient by the health workers. And so this is the resources that uh, if you want to know more about our information system, we have like YouTube channel for this as to tracker. And then we also have like user manuals of our developed system. If you want to contact me, I have also provided my email here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Keshe, for the insightful presentation. So I think that this system is a perfect example of uh, the fact that it's easier to build systems uh, technically, but it takes a lot more effort in implementing those systems and increasing the adoption of the system at the end user level, because that's where the whole challenge lies of making a uh, developed system into a success story uh, which has been in the case of Nepal so it has taken around four years of effort from the country team uh, and the technical agencies supporting the system in country to kind of take it up to a level where uh, the ART centers have adopted the system now and have uh, started using the advantages the system offers uh, uh, as part of its functionalities. Uh, so, in terms of the uh, questions, we have one question from Ibrahim Manesi. Uh, Dr. Keshav, uh, the question is regarding the internet availability. Um, uh, is the internet available at the ART sites at a consistent level? Uh, or else if it's not available, do we have another ways of reporting or sending the data? Mm, yes, few sites are still especially in uh, remote hills and mountain areas. Uh, they are like facing like slow internet issues. Uh, to address uh, that issue, like we have developed this uh, mobile uh, based app so that they can enter the data, record data during offline. And then they can go to any like uh, uh, offices which have like good internet uh, access within the hospital premises or in, in primary healthcare centers. So. Uh, we developed it with support from Miss India, and a few of the sites are using it, uh, but they are like still like facing 
um, to use uh, like challenges to use this uh, mobile based app because uh, they complain like it takes a lot of time to install and use uh, these sites which will we we will address after um, like in coming days thank you thank you for the response so are there any more questions for dr keshav you guys can also unmute yourself and ask questions if you want to ask questions uh, uh, through your machines or um, you can add questions on the chat box we can take up the questions at the end of the sessions as well uh, so thank you dr keshav for the presentation um, we can move to the next presentation now uh, dr john if you can share your screen and present the tb information system in lao please um are you seeing my screen uh yes if you could just uh, uh put it into presentation mode if possible yeah yeah great yeah you're seeing my presentation on my screen right yeah yes yes please go ahead uh hi all uh, my name is john lewis from um university of Ostland history of uh, based in uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh city uh, i've been looking after dhs to implementation in uh, southeast asia uh, focusing uh, mainly on Laos and uh, the other countries in, uh, in Southeast Asia and Pacific Islands. Uh, today, what I'm going to <coughs> present is about use cases, DHS tracker use cases in, in Laos, uh, focusing on TB, and plus how, uh, what are the different effort has been gone in the region to link the, the TB data across um, different countries and how do we address that one. So to begin with, Laos is a landlocked country. Um, the DHIS2 started uh, in 2014, the initial um, um, demo and the piloting, and then it was rolled out uh, in 2000, end of 2014 to national wide on aggregate based system. And in 2017, it was recognized uh, officially by Ministry of Health uh, with and also had a degree that like dhs2 will be a national integrated platform where all the health data will be stored so there are uh, thousands of um, people have been trained uh, it's a small country with a population of uh seven point um yeah seven point uh, one million um and it's um most of the health data has been used uh have been used dhs2 for the training DHIS2 is managed and maintained by uh, Department of Planning and Cooperation under Ministry of Health. So they are the one who are leading the uh, DHIS2 implementation across all the programs. So they provide the service um, with the support of East Vietnam and University of Oslo. Uh, we've been guiding the DPC in managing and maintaining the DHIS2. So they are the custodians of DHIS2 implementation in um, uh, Lao Ministry of Health. So they, that means they are the people who are actually maintaining their DHS to organize their, their hierarchy and all things and the rest of the different program, they can have their own form and other things to be installed and used at their, for their own program. Uh, just to give you a bit of idea on like what all the different programs which has been used. So uh, the foundation of, um, um, uh, DHS2 in Lao is we need to all the we had a lots of meeting uh, with the, all the different program people to integrate and agree on a common hierarchy uh, that like like we have national and then we have the province district uh, and under district we have all the health facilities so all the different departments there was like um, agreement saying that like we call the province as PHO provincial health office and district health office because each and every program, they had a different name. Um, like malaria, they call the uh, province as a province anti-malaria unit. HIV had uh, their own uh, terminologies. Uh, TB had their own terminologies at the province level, at the district level. So we just say we are like, whatever we just call, we call it as province health uh, office that includes all the different programs and everything uh, in that particular place. So that's where you get around. And then wherever it is, like it's a provincial, health, uh, provincial hospital, 
and under provincial hospital there can be multiple programs uh, to deal with so the first agreement was on organizational unit hierarchy and if there is any hospitals or anything to be added they will contact the dpc and they will manage the uh, the health facility list and providing the code and everything so that's was one thing what we uh, constantly agreed on and then based on that um, we since when we started we started only with aggregate the data and then slowly we moved to events and then to to tracker so if you just see some of the uh, the places you have aggregate and event for example uh, mch and the epi and when it comes to for pb it was um, aggregate and the tracker when you come to hiv it was aggregate tracker and the events so based on the need so there were been different things has been used um, in Lao, what we've been working around is also like a interoperable thing. So if a system has been already been rolled out, like example, M supply, which is basically a logistic management uh, information system uh, rolled out in many places. So we integrated the aggregated data from M supply to DHS too, so that the health worker can actually, health worker and health administrator can actually just see the data and analyze the data from the both supply chains and as well as the, the um, the program uh, things. So based on that one, so when we try to implement all these things, there uh, there also been lots of innovations happening. Yeah. So we extended, especially for the COVID, there have been lots of um, uh, planning and innovations are happening at the different level. So one thing was the data entry load was quite heavy at the health worker side, so they could not really cope with in doing all the data entry. So what we did was is to give the public the access where they can actually register for their own information. That means they enter their first name, last name, answer all the questions. So the health worker can actually do the review when they come for the, the vaccination. So that really helped the health worker in reducing the data entry burden. And they just like update the, the vaccination details uh, and a few other the screening uh, tests. So this was actually uh, helpful for the health worker side and for the public side, it also helped on so that they don't really have to wait for longer queue so they can select the vaccination site and also the, the time. So when they want to visit and based on that one, they can actually come to the, the line. So the getting the vaccination for the COVID really helped on that one. The second one, which was, is to have this um, green card or the, the yellow card on their mobile phone. Um, so this is, um, uh, so they can install, this can be downloaded using the, um, the Android Play Store or the App Store, which is still under development and testing phase. So they've been going to release this one soon so that a um, citizen can actually download the data. And the data is coming from DHIS too. If the person has been fully vaccinated, they will get as a green card. If the person is not fully vaccinated, they get as a yellow card on their mobile phone. So these are the different services and things what we've been trying to use uh, in, in Lao. So now coming back to the focus um, to on the TB. Um, TB, like since like we had the um, uh, agreement in 2017, uh, TB was uh, started using the aggregate data entry where we collected aggregate data from a province, district, and central level of hospital uh, for every quarter. TB is a quarterly based system, and especially on the aggregate side. So they started with that one and they rolled out in, in all the uh, TB units and the, the, the provincial uh, um, health uh, facilities. So that went on quite well. And then they wanted to move around to the tracker. So what we did was in 2018, we started in one particular province and we adopted the WHO TB uh, package and customized it for Lao needs. And plus also included um, TB tracker, uh, contact tracing also, because in WHO package that particular time, we didn't really have the TB uh, uh, contact tracing. What we had TB case surveillance and we included the, the contact tracing of the TB. And then we rolled out in Lumpabang province to see like how it was working. So there were quite a lot of challenges, uh, things like just on the people, the first time they would try to use the, the tracker, the concept of like writing from the patient level, uh, the paper base to, to online. And then like it's a one particular um, system. So where you register a particular person one time and then you can follow it up for the entire treatment. So there was quite a lot of uh, training uh, involved. 
Um, so that also went on quite well. Um, and after the pilot, there was a, a review. And after the review in 2019, it was scaled on to all the other TB units um, for uh, reporting all the things. Plus, right now, we have been also working with one of the NGOs where we are trying to create the prism to TB because right now, um, what health system gets is only the people who have been confirmed as, uh, as a TB positive case. That's only when they get into treatment. But the, there have been lots of other issues on there are many people they've been just like suspected and they are negative those informations are not been stored only aggregate data has been stored so with help of this ngo so where they can actually do the data entry that's also something which we've been working on just to give a, a bit of things so aggregate data is stored in a different server where we just say um, HMIS code outla is basically for the aggregate server uh, that means not only depending on the tp but also for all the other programs this is the where like we store all the data and for patient level uh, the dpc department of planning and operation created a new server where all the patient level data has been stored irrespective of whether it is tb malaria hiv uh, things say so everything is in this server so the differentiation was when we have a, a patient based uh, server so it's it's good you should have more authority more security and all so that's why like it was created as a separate uh, server of the and where we store the patient level data. Uh, initially, when we started, like there have been lots of disaggregation, especially when you look at the DB form, it's broken up by uh, present cases, the, uh, the age breakup and all. So they have been um, collecting all those things. So when we moved to the tracker, it really helped the people in, in adopting that. Um, the first things like when we started also, there have been lots of negotiation on uh, with TB, HIV, malaria uh, department on getting the patient attributes right. So we didn't really want one attribute for TB, one attribute for, uh, for HIV. For example, on the occupation, on the, the sex, so we should all agree on the same attribute. So it required a bit of negotiation and talking around so that like we use, if it is an occupation, education, ethnicity um, to be included and also UIC. In Lao, we don't really have a um, national ID for all the people. Uh, so what we did was is to create a UIC, which is used not only for TB, but also for malaria and also for, um, for HIV, which includes first name, last name, date of birth, sex, and the birth province. Uh, one additional field which we included in all the programs was um, the current address, where people have to just select where the, which province and which district and which village, but village is not, is an optional, but province and districts are, um, uh, need to be re required, plus the birth province. So UIC usually use that one and it is shared across other, other places. So that means if a person has already been registered in one particular place, let's just say malaria program, TB can actually use that search, that particular person and enroll and give their own TB ID, that's okay. Um, so then they don't really have to, register uh, other person again. Um, so this requires tracker, DHS2 tracker is a, when you register a particular person can be enrolled into multiple program. Uh, only the authorized person can have a look into uh, TB and malaria. So this also the, again, um, uh, sorry, uh, TB and HIV. So this again, the, um, there've been lots of discussion on how best we can and who should be able to have the access. So that's also the other things what we've been like working with them the DPC and the program head on uh, interoperability and sharing of the data. Um, since um, we use the WHO TB package, so these are all different fields which they have been already been configured. So we took that one and we included few local uh, terminologies and other things so that like we can try to use at the, uh, the, at the lower level. So these are the few outputs where people can actually just see where they're coming from. In um, Lao, what we did was each and every village is linked to um, uh, coordinate. So when users select uh, where they are from, so uh, health worker can actually just see where they are uh, getting the treatment and where they're actually coming from. So this also helped us in doing the analysis on looking at the, uh, the area-wise, um, the TB cases. 
um, and also their, their contact tracing. So that also really helped on all things. Um, apart from that one, what we did was also is to collect um, the nationality of the, the TPP patient. Most of them are from Lao, but like we also just saw they are from other countries like China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Myanmar. They've been also so getting the, the data and we could aggregate the data uh, based on our tracker things to include it. Before we only had Lao and others, but like as we evolve, like we just say, like we need to agree on the nationality and we had the, um, um, uh, two nationality. One is full list and one is small list. A small list was also should be agreed by all the different program people what to include. A full list requires a list of all the things based on, like for example, COVID and other things, we use the, the full list. And for the TB and other things, we use the, the simple list, which is basically a subset of the, the, the country. So it's easy for people to just select those, uh, those options. And based on that one, we can try to just see how many people have been cured from this particular country or transferred or lost to follow up. Uh, maybe they return back to their own country. We could not try to find those, those details. Um, that's basically it about from the, the Lao. There have been lots of lessons to be uh, learned and, and all. Um, what we also, with the University of Oslo and uh, Global Fund and this um, uh, regional TB um, um, program, um, which is supported by uh, Global Fund and implemented across um, um, the five GMS country, which is Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam. Uh, so this is a greater Mekong sub-region area. So where uh, there are lots of cross-border migrant um, uh, TB cases are happening, especially in Thailand, moving to Myanmar or Thailand to, to Laos uh, and Vietnam to Cambodia. So there was a no way of finding out like how people are, how do we get this information? Um, for in that one, like this, this project started in late 2019, um, but then like COVID happened. So there have been lots of hiccups and like we could not travel and all. So the initial idea was each country can share their, their data to a regional data warehouse, especially for the people who've been um, uh, migrant cases who've been like treated uh, um, from one country to other country and how best the information can be shared. So we wanted to, to study each and every country, how things are. Only Lao is using DHS2 and Myanmar, um, only the aggregate, but the, for their own TB uh, tracker information, they're using country different system. Thailand is using country different system, their own uh, in-house built. Same thing with Cambodia and Vietnam. So it was a challenge to how best we can try to integrate. And for the regional data warehouse, DHS2 was selected as their uh, warehouse where the different countries' data can be stored across. There were two steps. One is to, for aggregate data, and other one is on the patient level data. Only for the international uh, transfer, that data can be stored and shared across, and only authorized person can be able to see. This project is still undergoing and like they've been working together and lots of different lessons has been learned how do how do we best implement a tracker solution not only in a country but across the country where the, the data can be shared <clears throat> so just there have been already been lots of um, uh, small scale project happening between two hospitals they've been using line whatsapp or facebook to send the data from one particular hospital to other, other hospitals where they can actually share and re-enter the, the, the same system across. So this has been happening between Laos and in, um, in Thailand. Uh, same thing also in Laos and in um, um, Vietnam in one particular place. Uh, same thing with uh, Myanmar and Thailand where they have different things and lots of NGOs um, and CSOs are been helping in dealing with that. Uh, for people who are familiarized with the um, uh, TB information system, like when a person is transferred uh, within the country, they usually have a TB09 form, which is a transfer form where they enter the patient details and the classification. And then there is a part B where the people just like to say, so these are the, the referring unit where they're going to send. And the third part is the if the people have been uh, accepted, so they get an acknowledgement receipt. 
So that's how it it uh, it works now. And this has been implemented. This um, form was implemented in Myanmar and Thailand border, uh, where people can actually share their data across, and the person who's been treated in one particular place can continue his treatment in other country. So this was the something which we have been working with. The challenges where it's also like in Southeast Asia, every country speak very different languages and they, they have different script. So we can't even guess like what this one is until unless a person knows all the different languages. Uh, so this, so then like we just say, like we need to have a common level of agreement on when we do the data sharing. It's not only about your uh, host, just like even the hospital name was complicated to understand. But then again, like we need to have all the, the organoids and everything to be translated in, in local language and in English as the common denominator, plus the name of the particular person who have been transferred. In each and every um, uh, country, all their name, even though they are from different country, they were been uh, stored locally uh, in local language. Like if a person from Thai uh, comes to, to Lao, he, the Lao person will enter his name in Lao language, not in, in English. So this has been the, the challenge. So we worked uh, around and we just say, we will keep one local language and one translated language, especially for the people who've been translated across. Um, we also did a few changes in the WHO global package where we had all the treatment details, but we didn't really have the referral and the outcome. So what happens is like when a person is transferred out from one particular country to other country, um, SMS, um, sorry, uh, email is sent to the national NTP uh, that like this particular person is going to come to your place and you might visit this particular province. So that once it has been there, so like they will, the receiving country can actually just say whenever they come around, okay, this particular person is admitted in this particular hospital or continuing this treatment in this particular hospital. And that once they're accepted, a message is sent back to the to receiving country just saying this this is the person and this is a new id which has been accepted around and this is the treatment detail and once they finish the, the outcome um, sms is also sent back or sorry email is sent back as a notification saying this particular person is either cured or lost a follow-up or, or relapse or whatever so these are the different things which we've been trying to work on the other main key issue which we've been working with is also on the Documentation, documentation type, especially when we come with the migrant workers, they've been, they don't really have um, actual um, documentation, especially in the, the poorest uh, uh, area. So they might have 10 year car, a driving license, a temporary passport, or health insurance, or border pass. So we've been collecting list of all the document types, and so that like we can try to include um, those people. And then um, we can try to, um, to follow it up. And this has been a, a joint effort between University of Oslo, uh, IOM, all the uh, TB uh, people um, from all the different countries, University of Oslo, Global Fund, on trying to just see how best we can try to, to use all the things. So these were the few of the example where the notification is sent from one particular place to, to other, other area. Uh, this is uh, something, a new innovation, which we've been trying to, to work with, lesson from, from COVID so vaccine certificate. During the COVID vaccine certificate, what we learned was uh, there is no global database of a particular person who've been vaccinated. So usually the, all the data is stored in a QR code. Um, and if a country wants to be uh, accepted, so only the, the public key has been shared across the, the neighboring countries so that they can read this QR code and just say, okay, this particular person has been already have uh, this, this, this vaccination and it can be allowed wrong. So we took that um, concept and we've been trying to implement that one in for the, the TB and cross-border migrant places where sharing the data for one particular country and other countries is always challenging, especially with the, the patient data and all. So we, it's also one of the alternative solutions where um, data can be either printed or a person can have a smartphone and have the QR code. So the other country or the hospital can read it and authenticate it that okay, this is a person and these are the different details. Um, we've been also been trying to think how this data can be pulled back into the system so that like people don't really have to do the data entry again. So these are the different concepts and the things which has been 
under uh, development. And there have been lots of uh, lessons been learned and also challenging. So Tracker, it's always has to be, it's a evolving system. It is nothing um, which we just like uh, put in as, as a stone. Like for example, in the Lao PB, we just like included first name and last name. After dealing with uh, the migrant issue, we just say, okay, we should also have uh, first name in English, last name in English, so that like uh, it can be uh, useful across when the people are traveling uh, to the neighboring countries. Uh, plus also the, um, uh, the document, the country list was also the something which was included based on the discussion at all. So we always need to think through on adopting and changing the, the tracker when we always implement. Um, there are new things will come around a new uh, process and all. So based on that one, uh, both the implementation and the technical solution should go hand in hand in the changing of the requirement. It is not only the technical solution, but it's also on how best we how we can implement in our own country based on country local settings. Uh, basically, that's um, a way what we've been trying to deal with and the referred out, referred uh, in, uh, who has the access, who can change the demographic details. So those are the few um, working um, securities or the SOPs, what we've been like working across with all the, the five countries in GMS region. Um, if you have any question, please let me know. I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for the insightful presentation. It's, the use cases are certainly very interesting to uh, understand cross-border dynamics and how the information can be managed better when the patient moves from one country to another. And of course, handling migrant population data is always a challenge. Uh, there was one question in the chat. Uh, if you could just give a little more background on the use of uh, QR codes in the COVID vaccination uh, project in Laos and in general, how you have used QR codes and if the community can take uh, uh, some benefits from the developments that you've done. Actually, the QR code is from University of Oslo and his Vietnam joint team working uh, closely with, with EU um, the green card pass. So that's the, the schema, what is what we have been used to generate that one. It's similar to WHO standards, but like WHO standards used fire. There have been multiple COVID schema. Um, one is EU, one is common pass, one is other things. But the idea is the simple. We are taking the data from DHS2 and uh, converting it into a common uh, um, terminologies which can be accepted across all the places. For example, the vaccination manufacturing portal is as a global key, and that is what has to be recorded. And one, none of the DHS two people like um, we store those keys. We just like store only the uh, the vaccination name and the manufacturing things, but not all the different details. So that's the um, the one thing which we which we try to to deal with. Um, and it's um, uh, this QR code things. I can give you all the the, the links in the chat um, where you already have a, a public facing a GitHub where you can try to download all the things. Same thing with um, uh, with um, sorry. The same thing with um, uh, the uh, you know Stefoslo and DHS to uh, team. They also have created a public mm. GitHub place where people developers can actually use this code and can customize it for their own needs. Thank you, John. So uh, once you share the, the resources in the chat, we can share with the participants through, through the Academy Slack channel. Um, thank you. Uh, so if there are any more questions, please feel free to add to the chat box. Uh, we can take up at the end of the session. So thank you, John, for uh, your precious time. And I guess we can move ahead uh, with Dr. Pamut, who would be presenting the Sri Lankan use case on COVID surveillance and vaccination. Uh, Dr. Pamut, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Saurabh. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, so a uh, lot of familiar faces, and it's uh, so nice to see you all again. 
Uh, so now uh, we have had two presentations on how uh, the DHIS2 tracker is used in different contexts, both from uh, two different Asia, uh, countries in Asia. So what I'm going to do next is to take a use case uh, from Sri Lanka and also uh, try to figure out like uh, when you are a DHIS2 implementer or uh, probably you are, you are uh, holding a technical or administrative position in the Ministry of Health, uh, how we are going to decide whether we can use the tracker, right? Because most of the time it's, it's going to be a very challenging uh, decision where a lot of uh, variables uh, are at play. And so I will try to explain that uh, using how we adopted DHS2 tracker uh, for COVID-19 surveillance in Sri Lanka. So uh, what uh, the other thing that uh, I want to highlight in this presentation that I'm going to do is to uh, uh, show you how you can take the DHS2 tracker forward uh, than the default DHS2 tracker that uh, comes bundled in the DHS2 package. I think uh, Joan has already shown you a lot of potential of DHS2. So, uh, but you have to keep in mind how DHS2 uh, tracker is different from aggregate is that uh, you always have potential to expand it further. Um, I mean, based on your country's potential, team's potential, as well as your imagination uh, to ultimately provide better healthcare to your own country. So uh, let me share my presentation. Right. So uh, this work uh, uh, actually happened. Uh, we, we, we started, of course, with COVID-19 about one and a half years or even more than that in Sri Lanka. And I'm going to kind of uh, mention you like how it evolved over time first and then uh, specifically targeting on uh, what are the different components of tracker that we are using in DHIS2. And uh, I mean, how we have been, I mean, what are the challenges we have been, we, we have encountered and how we have been able to address them. So a little bit of history. Uh, now Sri Lanka uh, got its first case of COVID-19 in 27th January. So that is just one month after the world got to know that COVID exists. And we had one discussion with the Ministry of Health on 20th January to decide what is the software platform we were going to use uh, for COVID-19 surveillance? So these are some uh, requirements that came from the ministry. I um, highlighted them, uh, these factors for you to get an idea, like what would be the challenges you as an implementer, or as a technical or administrative head in the Ministry of Health or an NGO uh, might encounter when you get a project. So here, some requirements that we had was uh, you have to uh, uh, enable multi-sector uh, collaboration and sharing of data and the system, the, the tracker-based implementation has to be developed within a few days, as opposed to like what you usually get like a couple of months. And then of course, uh, because it was kind of a, uh, I mean, uh, the beginning of a pandemic, it was an outbreak in most of the countries. You can't follow the long procurement processes. It has to be rapid. And of course, uh, you may need to start with few health facilities as a pilot. And then you may need to rapidly scale it up the entire country. And of course, the requirements were not initially identified. I mean, this is the case in uh, uh, most of the you know, implementations around uh, 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 new health, is health issues. So for example, COVID was very new at that time. So everyone was not clear like what would be the final set of requirements. So uh, a specific requirements document was not there. And of course, uh, you have to attend to uh, the needs of diverse stakeholders. You will have to think of how to train them. Uh, I think uh, uh, both the presentations before, it was highlighted like training is uh, a mandatory thing. But of course, because uh, even though it's mandatory, it's going to be a challenge uh, when you're trying to implement a tracker-based system. And of course, you might also require mobile data capture and uh, integrate with the existing systems, which are already there. So what we did was we selected DHIS2 platform mainly because we had the capacity and we had the uh, confidence within ourselves, like our team, the Sri Lankan team, that we could do it in DHIS2 tracker. So uh, one thing I want to mention here is like, you might need some, um, uh, I mean, existing capacity within the country if you're going to implement a large scale or a kind of a very complicated tracker implementation, as opposed to a very simple tracker where you are using few uh, data entry forms um, and probably few very simple workflows. 
And the DHIS to be customized. So in this entire COVID-19 related implementation, we had few aggregate components, but most of them were tracking. But we could not uh, serve all the requirements the ministry had with this standard customization of DHIS2 tracking. This is where we had to do some advanced uh, custom developments. So to do that within a short span of time, uh, we got support from other stakeholders within the country. So uh, especially the ICT agency, like this is a government uh, ICT agency, which is a, a, a government owned organization. And of course, there were like uh, volunteer developers. I mean, they were mainly from the private sector. And we also got support from the University of Oslo and the DHS2 community. So with that, we were able to uh, develop four other additional modules and create few integrations. With that, we were able to produce the COVID-19 surveillance package for Sri Lanka. So again, like this, we diffuse uh, whatever we, we learned uh, in our context with the global, uh, I mean, the DHS2 community. So with, uh, I mean, with inputs from that, as well as other countries, the University of uh, Oslo was able to provide and uh, develop and disseminate this uh, COVID-19 digital health data toolkit for global use. So this is kind of a, a timeline of, uh, I mean, highlighting how fast the different modules were developed. So you can see like from um, early February, uh, by about May, we were able to have all these modules developed. Like these were not just DHIS2 customizations that you can do from the front end, but in addition, we had to do some further developments as well. It did not actually uh, stop there, right? So after the initial uh, implementation, we had to maintain the system, especially throughout the last year. And towards the uh, early this year, we had our, uh, sec uh, I mean, like, uh, following our second wave of COVID-19, we also had the requirement to cater the vaccination, the COVID-19 uh, vaccination related requirements by the dhs 2 based system. So this was a massive challenge for us. I will explain like why it was uh, like that uh, towards the end. So what I wanted to say was like, this is not just one time work. When you are trying to implement Tracker, you have to be agile and you will have to keep on developing components. So this is the kind of ecosystem of different modules around COVID-19 surveillance, which is there in Sri Lanka. So uh, what I want to highlight here is like, say for example, initially, like when uh, the uh, COVID-19 started, the focus was more on the port of entry and then it changed to quarantine. And then when there were like more critical ill patients, uh, we had to design, uh, we had to focus more on hospital-based uh, system as well as the ICU bed tracking system. So I'm trying to highlight the trajectory of the requirements and development of modules might change with the uh, changing disease epidemiology. If you are like, uh, especially if you're trying to develop a tracker-based implementation for surveillance. So this you have to keep in mind. So, uh, because like, if you try to, you know, like plan everything and uh, prepare a budget, uh, which only focuses on, uh, you know, uh, the, the development which happens at the initial phase of the uh, implementation, this might not always be true. So you need to be kind of a bit prepared to uh, address these kind of challenges. And of course, like from end, I mean, towards the beginning of this year, our main focus was around the immunization and then to create uh, uh, the requirements around the citizen portal and issuing vaccination certificates. And of course, few other uh, integrations. So let's now focus on, I mean, like, what were the additional developments that we were able to do in, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, as opposed to the generic DHS2 tracker that we have. So what you're seeing here is uh, like, you must be very familiar. It's a generic tracker capture, but because I'm talking about advanced uh, implementation, we had some challenges, especially related to tracker uh, performance and based on some end user experience. So based on that, we had to modify the tracker capture a bit so that uh, we were kind of uh, able to reduce uh, the, the, the transmission of uh, uh, the data back and forth between the tracker capture front end, front end application and the DHS to main platform to the API. So for the, to do that, we, we did some modifications here. So that's why you are seeing uh, like say, for example, this uh, uh, the text in red, as well as, uh, of course, you can't see here, we have an other additional button so that we were able to push the data at once to the DHIS2 
instance from the tracker capture. And also you can uh, see on this right top corner, we created additional uh, widget in the tracker capture to issue the certificate. So this is kind of some additional work that we had to do based on the requirements of the company. And this is the contact mapping visualization application, which we designed based on the initial requirements, especially uh, in the initial part of COVID-19, where uh, like we had less number of cases um, and we needed to map it out at national level, like how the disease uh, transmission took place uh, across the population. And of course, this application, I mean, again, another thing that I want to highlight is like, if the tracker implementations are very complex, you might need to get support from uh, the DHS2 community as well as the regional HISP uh, nodes, especially Asia, in the Asia region. We have like uh, uh, very senior HISP uh, uh, nodes, uh, such as uh, HISP India and Vietnam. They have been around for a very long time. So you can always contact them and get their support uh, in case you need this kind of advanced implementations. And this is like uh, we, were, we were initially wanting to track the uh, uh, mobility of the patients, like uh, based on, of course, uh, with their cons uh, consent. So this is one uh, additional module we created uh, on top of the existing DHS2 tracker to uh, integrate the location-based information that we captured from the mobile tower networks. And we also designed an ICU bed tracking application. So this is again a tracker. So uh, what I want to highlight is like we consider we configure the DHS2 tracker just like what we normally do. But only thing that is changing here is rather than using the tracker capture application, you can design the uh, custom DHS2 web application. So you have, I mean, you can define your own interfaces. So exactly, this is what we have done here because the ICU staff, they did they wanted a very simple interface just to mark the status of the bed, whether it is available, whether it is not, whether, it, whether you can reserve that bed. So for this, we designed a custom application which is working on top of the standard DHS2 track. Right. Then uh, I will move on to the COVID vaccination. So I will take this as an example to... Um, explain the challenges that you might encounter in advanced tracker implementations and how you can, um, I mean, like how you can be prepared to uh, face these challenges. So COVID-19 vaccination, again, like uh, we, we had to, uh, I mean, uh, work a lot, especially our team, because we had uh, uh, no experience from uh, other others in the community or in implementing this because we had to, um, uh, one thing, because uh, we were kind of, I mean, in fact, we were the first country to implement it in a kind of a very large scale manner uh, nationally. So for that, our team, we, I mean, like we didn't, we didn't do it alone. We always uh, have discussions with the DHS community as well as regional HISP nodes to see uh, what, what they have gone through across uh, all these years when implementing tracker. So similarly, before implementing the uh, COVID-19 for vaccination, we had a discussion with uh, India and Vietnam to understand the challenges they have gone through um, in uh, implementing large-scale tracker. So based on that, we designed a module which has a couple of components. One thing is the immunization tracker, then you have the stock monitoring, digital vaccination certificate, and of course the citizen portal for booking the appointments. So um, inside this module, as I mentioned, the stock component, we were using the DHS to aggregate. But for everything else, we were using DHS2 track. Now, initially we started off with uh, using the simple, the default standard DHS2 tracker ca capture application um, uh, to capture the data. So the modifications I showed you previously uh, were done uh, after implementation. Like, so these, these took place about uh, three to four months after the uh, implementation of the vaccination instance in DHS2. So, I want to highlight, right, you might have to do changes, you might have to learn from your implementation and the challenges and uh, modify accordingly. So you actually cannot plan the entire trajectory sometimes uh, right at the beginning. So in the case-based uh, uh, tracker data, we are capturing the uh, vaccination information, the first and second doses. Now, of course, we now to complicate things further, we are now planning uh, to incorporate data for the third dose because uh, the government is preparing uh, to vaccinate selected uh, pop, uh, population sectors on the third dose. So we have to get prepared uh, to incorporate those requirements. And we also have the AEFI component as well as 
a separate uh, uh, vaccination module specifically targeting information uh, for pregnant uh, mothers. And the next important thing about DHIS2, it's uh, the analysis and visualizations. So for tracker analysis and visualizations, so there are several uh, built-in capabilities. So the first thing is like we have different analytic tools in DHIS2. So you may be already aware that uh, if you're coming from an aggregate background, we have tools such as the data visualizer, yeah, you can uh, design charts as well as now the pivot table, the tabular uh, output, you can use that one. And you have the maps application in DHS2 to, to create uh, uh, visualizations of I mean the uh, GIS visualizations. And of course, you can put these visualizations in the dashboard so that uh, people will be able to quickly compare uh, across different uh, analytic output and uh, take the decision. So, um, what you're seeing here is one uh, very simple visualization that we have done uh, using the DHS2 uh, built-in tools, right? So these kind of charts are quite simple. And then of course, you can always have dashboards such as this, where you kind of uh, put together different pieces of analytic outputs that you create using the analytic tools in DHS2. So just like in the aggregate, you can also design them in the tracker and put them in the dashboard. And then in addition, you must be familiar that you can always download data out, uh, I mean, from the DHS2 and take it outside and do your own analysis uh, using Excel. So it's also possible for trackers. Say for example, if you want to download a line list, this is definitely possible in tracker as well. In addition, we also did something called SQL views. So this SQL weaves is an advanced uh, uh, kind of uh, analytic um, uh, feature which is available in DHS2. So say for example, if uh, something is not, I mean like if you want to uh, obtain a particular table which is not possible using the, I mean uh, the default uh, uh, visualizations or the analytic tools as well as the API, you can of course use this SQL weave. So we are why I mentioned this is because like uh, in the I mean uh, as our uh, next visualization um, strategy, we are using custom applications. So in, when you are doing this custom application, sometimes you will have to use this SQL views as well. So just want to tell you like, you have endless number of possibilities of uh, having even visualization. So uh, like the next time before you say to a client or to the ministry that this is not totally possible uh, on DHS2, what you can do is probably you can uh, discuss this in the DHS2 community and ask whether other countries have uh, gone through the same experience and uh, what are their learnings. So this, in fact, is one custom application that we, where we are using the SQL weaves as well as the DHS2 web API. So here we wanted to, you know, like uh, uh, give some visualizations based on some outputs uh, which we were not directly obtained from the standard analytic tools. So for, to do that, we kind of created the custom dashboards within the DHS2. So this is, of course, for our uh, issuing of vaccination certificates. So we needed some uh, statistics from how many certificates generated and things like that. So to do that, to do that we kind of used another custom dashboard. Okay, so a uh, little bit of background about the vaccination certificate. So again, we started uh, early this year. What we did was we did some modifications to the existing tracker capture to include a widget. And then we also used another service. I will come back to it a bit later, another uh, global public good called DIVOC. So we created uh, an integration between DHIS2 and DIVOC. Um, and then based on that, we were able to produce this uh, certificate. So initially when we started this work, we were ba uh, we, we based on this uh, Smart vaccination certificate guidelines that WHO published. Uh, uh, it was early this year, but of course, after that, there have been a couple of other publications, uh, recommendations from WHO. Um, but like this is a kind of a star sample certificate that uh, we are producing in Sri Lanka. So, to do that, what we do is we have the DHIS2 like this with our standard tracker capture. And of course, we had to create this uh, pool called a custom backend. It's additional development. And then we integrate that with the uh, third-party service called Divo. And again, 
Uh, we also had to integrate the DHIS2 with the citizen portal because the citizen portal is where you are kind of booking the appointments uh, for the vaccination. So it's kind of like an integrated system where we have the DHIS2 and a few other systems that are kind of managed by uh, different entities of the government. So for example, the DHIS2 is directly managed by the Ministry of Health, whereas the uh, the DIVOC system and the uh, citizen portal is uh, mainly coordinated by the ICT, ICT agency of the government of Sri Lanka. Right, so challenges, of course, like uh, there were a lot of challenges, like, uh, for example, we needed some guidance on how to design these things, because it was totally new when you are trying to implement something for, a, uh, for, for something new to the world, like uh, COVID-19. And when it comes to the vaccination certificate, there was a requirement of pre-registering the entire adult population of the country into DHIS2. So for this, again, like uh, we didn't, I mean, like we didn't have much time to experiment by ourselves, even though we did. So here we, we took uh, inputs from uh, other his notes, especially, uh, I mean, John who presented before, like he had uh, done some large scale implementations before. So he had some experience around how to import this uh, uh, track entity instances or the persons into DHIS2 from an external source, like if you have a massive Excel or CSV file, how to get it in? Like, uh, of course, uh, we had very nice inputs from uh, uh, DHIS2 colleagues. So you really have to uh, collaborate with them uh, if you are uh, kind of uh, uh, doing something really new. And then DHIS2 has had some performance related issues. Uh, uh, for a large scale tracker implementation, most of which has been fixed uh, over the last few months, but still we are struggling at in some certain areas. So the best thing that you have to do is like, if you struggle with something like that, always put it on the DHS2 community so that you can get some feedback and also you can uh, make uh, uh, the DHS2 core team aware of the issues that you are facing. So these can be uh, fixed really fast. And Producing a cryptographically verifiable certificate was a major challenge because uh, uh, we did not have that functionality available in DHS2. And uh, the, the capacity uh, of your team to do these custom requirements can also be a major challenge. So how we um, address few of these challenges, like uh, now what country required was transparency across uh, the entire vaccination process for health managers at different levels. So to do that, we had to create different uh, level, I mean, dashboards at health facility level, that is like the vaccination centers. And we call, uh, we have a layer sub-district level called MOH, so the Ministry of Health. We have Medical Officer of Health Areas. It's kind of like a sub-district level where all the operation of uh, the vaccination takes place. So they needed their own dashboards to monitor. And at district level, they needed few additional requirements and at national level, you need a dashboards to be available for all the stakeholders, not only the health, but also for the, uh, um, I mean, like the COVID-19 steering committee, the main, main uh, the ministers and the higher level uh, officials of the government. So you had to create different types of dashboards to re, uh, suit these requirements. And pre-registration of the entire population, we were able to do, of course, with some, uh, some tools we developed uh, with, uh, with help of, of, of course, the University of Oslo and the global DHS2 team. And one thing is like DHS2 tracker and aggregate, you should uh, not kind of separate it out, although that's how you do it when you are configuring. You always should try to link it up so that uh, because DHS2 is primarily recognized globally uh, and it has been proven across the years as HMIS platform. So producing aggregate outputs is, uh, is really required. And sometimes uh, you might have to start with aggregate if your country's infrastructure and capacity is low. And then probably you might have, you might then decide to move to trackers. Say for example, you can start uh, one form or like with one program, you will go for track. Whereas you might have to continue with aggregate. So it's the same that we did uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, of course, we had to do some custom developments on DHIS2. Thankfully, we had the relevant expertise. Training and support is very crucial. Like uh, this is not totally a DHIS2 related thing. Like for any program that you are trying to uh, you know, introduce, you have to do some very good capacity building. And of course, you have to be available to provide support. So you have to plan all these things before you start uh, even DHIS2 customization because this, this sometimes uh, 
take a lot of time to build capacity within the country and to you know structure it uh, in a way uh, where the support can actually work. And we received inputs about uh, how to design the vaccination certificate from WHO and uh, various entities, which which was a uh, major input, especially the WHO country office, because the WHO country office was really instrumental in uh, uh, in implementing the DHS2 uh, vaccination system. They were providing technical support as well as they were collaborating across the stakeholders who were involved in uh, uh, in implementing this. And we had multi-sector collaborations within the government entities like the ICTA and development partners, as well as internationally, the DHS2 community and uh, the University of Austin. And of course, you always have to you know, plug into the existing system so that you can share data. If you try to create a system in isolation, there'll be a lot of resistance because everyone wants uh, uh, their I mean, uh, visibility of what is happening and they want to see data so that they can use it better. So that's the kind of uh, experience we had in implementing DHS2 track. So I will stop there and I'm, I'm ready to take uh, any questions if you have them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pamut for the insights. Uh, so as we all saw uh, in all three uh, projects that we saw the implementations that uh, the tracker implementations are basically a journey and they really don't stop at uh, the development and the implementation phase, they really keep moving ahead in terms of requirements, in terms of uh, adding new features and keeping them sustainable with uh, end user involvement, doing capacity building and uh, continuous sustenance. Uh, there was a question uh, regarding the use of QR codes. Uh, John and Pamut, if you could just share insights that when the uh, QR codes are scanned, do they take up the end user to uh, internet-based uh, link or a URL or the QR code itself has the information embedded? So they're asking which uh, way of implementing QR codes it's better, either through guiding uh, the user to a URL or showing the data which is already embedded in the QR code. Yeah, actually like uh, with the COVID especially, like, uh, you know, like we've been using QR code in many different places, it's not new, but like for the COVID, like what we call, it's a cryptographically verified QR code. That means it has a signing authorities and also data embedded to it. The One of the whole point with that one is anyone who is reading the QR code don't really need a internet or anything, uh, but only you should have a, a authorized key to read it. If he does not have an authorized key to read it, you won't, uh, you will just get some data, but you, you will be not able to actually view what it's inside. So that's the, the one of the, the things which uh, any uh, system, whether it is Divalk or EU or Common Pass or anything, they, that's the system what they are using. It's not really normal QR code, but it is a cryptographically very, uh, verified QR code with a public key and a private key. Public key is what has been shared across to all the places. Uh, just to add something to what uh, John says, uh, so I, I mean, like I, I totally agree with him. Uh, but to, but uh, now it all depends on what how you implement. So for in for example, in Sri Lanka, currently we are using the certificate only for the uh, uh, foreign travel purposes. So we have a link on the certificate uh, where like we have a verification portal where people can. Um, Go and verify. So that means it depends on uh, the internet. But uh, having said that, as John mentioned, because it has the QR code, the uh, necessary, the, the minimal information that is required is within the QR code. But one challenge that I mean, like if you if you are going to recommend it to someone, like if someone asks, like, can it be totally implemented uh, offline? There may be a few things to consider, like especially in the case of uh, like in case if some changes happen to a vaccination certificate, like say for example, there was some information which are not correct and you had to reissue the certificate. There is something called revocation of the vaccine of, of the vaccination certificate. So if that happens, then that information again needs to be updated uh, to whatever the offline verifying mechanism. So probably you might need a little bit of internet. Uh, probably periodically, but other than that, you uh, this, these solutions should be ideally 
are able to work offline. Uh, thank you, guys. I think that that was very useful. Uh, so we have uh, reached towards the end of the sessions we had planned for today. Um, again, I thank you, uh, Keshav, John, and uh, Pamot for sharing their presentations and insights. Uh, John has uh, added the resources for the QR code related information in the chat box. Uh, please take a note of that. We will also put those resources on the Academy Slack channel for future reference. Uh, the recording of the webinar would be uploaded on the YouTube channel. Uh, we will share the link uh, uh, on the Slack Academy page um, uh, for the participants who would like to visit uh, the webinar later. Uh, and any questions which are there um for all the three speakers please feel free to add them on the slack channel for the academy uh, we'll ensure that we uh, will contact them and get the necessary clarifications uh, which are uh, needed um, we hope that the webinar was useful for you to understand the different levels of tracker implementations that are happening in the asia region and we'll try to bring more uh, such use cases in our future webinars. Uh, just a reminder for tomorrow's webinar, we have another, the second webinar in the series uh, scheduled for tomorrow, same time, 12 to 2 p.m. India Standard Time, where we'll uh, discuss the, the latest tracker features and the future plans which are there in tracker development. So we'll have a two hour presentation and we'll take you through different uh, functionalities and features and what things are in pipeline. So hope you guys had a pleasant experience. Uh, we again thank you all for uh, giving us a, your precious time for attending the webinar. And we look forward to have you guys tomorrow in the webinar and also in the Academy beginning from next week, 25th. Uh, thank you guys and have a good day ahead. Bye-bye.